Hey everyone there in Chemistry 40, it's Dr. Carroll here. How are you doing? We are now going to look at Unit 1, Lecture 4, all about periodic trends. So you want to get out your booklet and your periodic table. Make sure somewhere down the line you printed up a good recent periodic table. And I'm going to be bouncing back and forth with that. Let's see, see here I go Alt-Tab and... I go there, so now I have a periodic table of the elements. And this one is from the OpenStax, a textbook we will use from time to time, which is on the website. You can download it. So I'm going to just make it uh, more old-fashioned, I think, better. So we have group 1A, Roman numeral 1A, so it's going to have one valence electrons. Group 2A, two valence electrons. Then we have B groups, which are transition metals. We're going to focus in our next chapter, more on chemical bonding of main groups. So let me just write the main group things here. Group 3A, Roman numerals are typically used. You don't have to use them. Group 4A, Group 5A, Group 6A, Group 7A, and Group 8A. The old days, that was called Group 0. So Group 1A are our um, alkali metals. Group 2A is alkaline earth metals. Group 3A is known as the boron family. Group 4 is the carbon family. Group 5 is the Adams family. No, it's not. It's called the Nictogens, P-N-I togens, but mostly just called the nitrogen family. Group 6 is the oxygen family, also called the calcogens, C-H-A-L-C-O-G-E-N-S. Don't have a calcogen and tonic unless you're over 18. Group 7A is the uh, halogens. And group 8A are our noble gases. So there's 118 elements in all. Organicin is the latest one to be discovered. Uh, seven rows, 18 columns. Dmitry Mendeleev created this. The greatest invention of all time. And if you want to Google that, you can see that I, in 2012, convinced 30 million Canadians on national television, CBC, that that was correct. We could talk about that another time. Let's get back to business. So um, we're going to look at periodic trends, things that repeat themselves. When you think of periodic, you think of something that repeats. Let me get a nice pen here. Okay. I don't need any comments. Uh, let's get what color shall we use today? How about a nice orange? So um, when you think of a periodical, like a magazine, in the old days people used to subscribe to magazines, like a Time magazine, it would come once a week. So its period was one week. Every week, you would get a new Time magazine. So it's something that repeats. And the periodic table, with all its magical stuff, also has, it's not magical, it's scientific, also has some trends, some repeating uh, graphs, properties. So... This helps us understand reactivity, helps us understand bounding, helps us understand a whole bunch of stuff. And let's start with one of the trends, which is called ionization energy. Uh, and the trend is actually for the first ionization energy, I1. Some books will call it IE subscript 1. But I1 is more commonly used and nowadays, I think, and it's the first ionization energy. So it's the amount of energy needed to remove a valence electron from a neutral gas atom. It has to be in the gas phase because otherwise there's more energies that are needed to uh, deal with to get uh, the values. So um, here we have uh, sodium gas. You pour in some energy, maybe gamma radiation, x-ray, UV, uh, whatever it is uh, visible, and you knock out an electron so it's been released, and you end up with Na+. So you have ionized, you have created an ion. And there are trends with the first ionization energy descending, so going down a family, the first ionization energy decreases, it gets smaller. Even though there's more nuclei, you think, oh, well, they're going to hold on to the electrons and the valence shell better, so we're going to have an easier job, so we don't need to put as much energy to ionize. Well, though, that's not true. There is what's called an effective nuclear charge 
which is basically the hold of the nucleus on the valence electrons, once you take into account all those intervening electrons, electron shells, which soak up that attractive energy. So you take all that screening, all that shielding into account and find out that it is easier to remove an electron much farther away from the nucleus than near it. So we see here, if I uh, do the... Um, sorting, there's lots of sorting here when you talk about trends. The first ionization energy of francium is less than cesium, is less than rubidium, is less than iodine, is less than potassium, is less than lithium. So uh, that is a trend that repeats itself. If you go to the second row, sorry, the second family, you would get the same information. So if I go to Alt tab here, my, uh, I would see that radium is the easiest to kick an electron out of, and beryllium is the hardest. Group 8, organicin would be the easiest to kick an electron out of, and helium would be the hardest. In fact, helium is the hardest of them all to kick out an electron. Okay, um, that worked well, didn't it? These trends, by the way, are focusing on main groups. So the groups with the A, 1A, 2A, oh, that doesn't sound good, main groups. 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. Uh, trends in the transition metal happen, but they're more subtle, not as big a difference, and we don't get to them in this course, so we will focus on trends of the uh, main group. So, um, going across a row, another name for a row is a period, of course. Uh, the first ionization energy increases because you don't have that screening, that blocking of the nuclear charge for the uh, valence electrons. The valence electrons are on the same shell. So there, going across the row, it is the number of protons that dictates how hard it is to remove an electron. So going from left to right across the row, the first ionization increases because the nuclear charge increases and the screening is not important. What's interesting is it's not, well, all of this is interesting, but the increase is not smooth. In fact, the second row, sorry, the second uh, group, alkaline earth, are happier than you might expect, and it takes more energy to kick an electron out of them. They have a filled S subshell. That's the rationale behind it. Similarly, the uh, fifth uh, family, the nitrogens, fifth main group, are happier than the oxygen. They have a half-filled P subshell, and that gives a little extra special stability uh, to those uh, elements. So it is harder to remove an electron from the fifth group than from the sixth group. So there's two little uh, flips around. Rather than going up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the first ionization energy goes up in one, three, two, four, six, five, seven, eight. So uh, remember that. And what's interesting is that repeats itself. Those uh, so-called anomalies, group two and group five, are higher in the third row as well, in the fourth row. In the fifth row, it blurs a little bit, but still the same general idea. So uh, I could ask you to arrange the third row in order of increasing ionization energy. So you're doing a sort. Whenever you do a sort, focus on the smallest and the largest, and then fill in what's the mushy, mushy middle, right? So in the third row, sodium is on the far left, so it is the easiest to kick an electron out of. Argon is the, is the hardest. So uh, then we fill out the middle using that one, three, two, four, six, five, seven, eight. So it's sodium, then aluminum, then magnesium, one, three, two, four, Silicon, sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, argon. Okay, sometimes I can ask you decreasing. So you put the largest one first, all right? Largest and then smallest at the other side. Always go from left to right when, uh, when you do these. Okay, uh, I notice here it says atomic mass. Hmm, it should say average atomic mass. Average atomic mass. Okay. So what is it? Two decimals, that's good. Okay, um, let's go back here. Uh, so 
now we know the trends for the first ionization energies and there's graphs you can look at uh, there's videos you can watch remember on our website uh, tiny URL the, the shortcut way to remember the website tinyurl.com slash vmchem in every uh, unit there is curated videos for your personal viewing pleasure um, under vidsu1, vidsu2, etc. and you can see uh, this described in more detail by the Brightstorm people and Tyler DeWitt who's a YouTube superstar right up there with PewDiePie or something so uh, look out okay or Ariana Grande or something like that okay I just wanted to say that um, if Ariana Grande went to Starbucks and ordered a large coffee would she get an Ariana Grande Grande I don't know anyways I hear some of you laughing higher ionization energies that means more energy so it turns out that once you knock out one electron you might have enough energy to knock out a second one and that's called the second ionization energy which is always harder than it is to get the first electron out and once two electrons are out it's harder to get out the next one which is the third ionization energy so in any element the third ionization energy is greater than the second is greater than the first and you can extend that the fourth ionization energy is greater than the third the fifth ionization energy is greater than the fourth etc why is that the case well one reason is you got less electrons you got the same number of protons but less electrons so those protons can get a better hold on the remaining electrons if there's less electrons it's like daycare workers and kids if some of the kids are away at home and there's the same number of daycare workers then they can get a better job keeping an eye on the remaining kids and it's harder for those kids to escape the daycare right um, another interesting reason is this notice how um, that's let's say that's 5,000 I'm just making up a number here 5,000 and this is 5100 but the first number I chose 300 when you go from 300 to 5,000 that's a really large gap, right? That's a big difference compared to 5,000 to 5,100. So what that means is you have kicked out a valence electron, and the next electron you want to kick out is now in an inner shell, right? It's in the second shell. Think of sodium, right? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. There's the electron configuration for sodium. So when I knock one electron out, that's the first ionization energy to kick out the next electron. Well, now you are in a shell much closer to the nucleus, so it's much harder to take that electron out. Once you do, you get 2p5, then the next one 2p4, but that's in the same shell, the second shell. So, yeah, there are less electrons, so it is larger, but it's not super larger compared to where the big gap is. So if you just have some numbers, you can predict what the valence is going to be, and I think we're going to see that right here okay uh, so look at element X here so we go uh, from 340 to 380 oh and then to 1900 and then 1950 so that means that it, the numbers are still increasing but after you kicked out the second electron to kick out the third is in uh, an inner shell so that's gonna be um, a lot harder to do that's why you got a big difference so you look where the big difference is and where that started is how many valence electrons there are um, here's some examples we've got to think a bit here we've got uh, second ionization energy of sodium is greater than the second ionization energy of magnesium that is true they're never going to be equal that's true because second ionization energy of sodium you are now removing electrons from the an inner shell, the n equals 2 shell. For magnesium, remember magnesium is a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. You kick out one electron, it's 3s1, but the second electron you want to kick out for the second ionization energy of magnesium is still in the third shell, so it's easier to kick it out than it is for sodium where it is in the uh, second shell. Okay, we can do other comparisons. Second ionization energy of sodium versus third ionization energy of magnesium. Okay, well now the third ionization of magnesium would be kicking an electron out of the 2p subshell. So that would be greater than sodium because 
there you're also kicking an electron out of the n equals 2 shell, but you only have 11 protons doing it. Magnesium, you have 12. And you can uh, do the other comparisons as, as you see fit. Okay, so going to the electron configuration is also is always a good thing. By the way, some kids get confused with the second ionization energy. They think it's the sum of how much energy is needed to kick out the first and the second together. That's not true. The second ionization energy is how much energy is needed to kick out the second electron, outermost electron, once the first outermost electron is taken out. Okay? Here's a question I enjoy asking. Uh, how much energy is needed to kick out the next electron from a whole bunch of species. So I have a whole list of species here. They are all isoelectronic. It works best, these questions, if they're all isoelectronic. In this case, they all have 10 electrons. So it's hardest to kick it out of the aluminum 3 plus, hardest, because that's 13 protons trying to rein in 10 electrons. Whereas nitrogen is the easiest because it's just seven protons trying to hold in 10 electrons. So it's hardest to kick the electron out of Al3+, and everything else follows nicely in line. Okay, this isn't one of these 1, 3, 2, 4, 6, 5, 7, 8 situations. It's just um, isoelectronic series. You're just counting how many protons you, there are because you have the same number of electrons all the way through. Okay? So... Closely related to uh, ionization energy is atomic and ionic radii. If we think of the and volume, if we think of an atom has a sphere, then we can talk about the volume of the sphere. Here's the, my radius, volume. Some of you may have done this in math, four thirds pi r cubed. So we can talk about atomic volume, and that's important in terms of, uh, for example, you want to. Uh, fortify you want to strengthen some glass and you want to put in some potassium ions will they fit in between your quartz crystals your silicon and oxygen and make it stronger or are they too big and they won't fit in you'll have to use some sodium uh, compound instead so that's one example of volume and uh, way back when in 1987 along with some other guys i was part of a uh, paper that appeared in, I think, Journal of the American Chemical Society about atomic volumes. 1987. That wasn't that long ago, was it? Okay. Uh, so we approximate a atom as being a sphere, and we're going to look at uh, the radius of the atom. Uh, well, my dogs just came in, but they're going to let me keep talking here. I'm sure they're interested in atomic and ionic radii as well. So um, there's no anomalies with these. Uh, in general, as the first ionization increases, the atoms get smaller. So again, helium is the smallest atom of them all. It's the one that is hardest to kick an electron out of. There's no shielding. And francium is the largest atom of them all because there's all these intervening shells. And uh, it's the biggest atom, too, in terms of volume. So rather than continuing talking about atomic volume, it's easy just to talk about atomic radii, radii being the plural of radius, and we'll get to ionic radii in a minute. So um, the atoms get smaller as you go across any main uh, group row, um, any row associated with the main group elements. Again, the transition metals we won't uh, look at here. So lithium is the largest, neon is the smallest in our second row. If I go, let's go back to this fancy newer periodic table here in the third row, sodium is the largest and argon is the smallest. In the fourth row, potassium is largest and krypton is the smallest. In the fifth row, rubidium is the largest and xenon is the smallest, etc. Okay. Um, and descending a group, R increases, so the atoms get larger. So, example, in the alkaline earth, it's not alkali earth, it's alkaline earth uh, group. Beryllium is the smallest and radium is the largest. So, doing these sorts, look for the extremes, fill in the middles, use the proper inequality signs, less than or greater than. 
Ionic radii is a bit more involved uh, because the uh, question has to be asked, is it a cation or an anion when we're looking at a crystal and trying to find out uh, the uh, ionic radii. So for a cation, the cation is smaller than a corresponding neutral atom. So for example, sodium plus is smaller than sodium. Uh, magnesium two plus, well, it's smaller than magnesium plus, which in turn, turn is smaller than magnesium. Uh, H plus is smaller than hydrogen, that's for sure, right? Hydrogen is just a proton and an electron maybe a neutron, I don't care about that. H plus, we don't have the electron anymore, so it's going to have to be uh, smaller. Um, anions are bigger than their corresponding uh, neutral atom. F minus is bigger than F because F minus has nine protons, but it's got ten electrons. F is nine protons with nine electrons. Let me go back to the cation for a second using electron configuration. Na plus would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Na is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, right? So you got an electron, valence electron in the third shell. When you kick that electron out to get your sodium cation, you now no longer have anything in the third shell. So, I know people don't like when teachers say obviously, uh, but obviously, it's going to be smaller, okay? Because it doesn't have any electrons in the third shell. Fluoride would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Fluorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So you have another electron in the second shell for fluoride, but it still is in the second shell. You don't have it in any other shell. Still, though, there's nine protons trying to rein in ten electrons, like nine daycare workers trying to rein in ten kids. You can't do as good a job as nine daycare workers trying to rein in nine kids, so fluoride is a little bit larger uh, than fluorine. Here I have a one again, an isoelectronic iso series, a jumble of, which one are these? Let's see, 10, yeah, 10 valence electrons, and I want you to arrange them from smallest to largest. So aluminum three plus has got 13 protons holding in 10 electrons, so it is the smallest, and the largest is going to be, here I go, with the N3 minus. So AL3 plus is the smallest and N3 minus is the largest and then you just fill it in from there. Electronegativity is another uh, periodic trend. Electronegativity is a long word. Some books write EN. I don't like writing that because it looks too much like an energy thing. Um, the Greek letter chi, C-H-I, is used. It's this italicized looking X thing. And it is something we're going to look in much greater detail in the second unit. But electronegativity, for now, we just want to look at the trend. It increases as you go across and decreases as you go down a group. So increases across a row, decreases down a group. It measures how strongly an atom and a molecule attracts valence electrons to itself. Non-metals have higher chi than metals. The noble gases really don't have values for electronegativity because they don't form that many uh, molecules, so there really isn't sufficient data to give an accurate value for electronegativity. So electronegativity is still a model, a theoretical model, but it does help us understand polarity of bonds, polarity of molecules, lots of stuff but we're, which we're going to do in the second unit. Of all the atoms, fluorine, is the most electronegative. The chi value for fluorine is 4.0 according to the Pauling electronegativity scale and uh, the electronegativity decreases from fluorine in all directions. Way back when I was talking about 1987 around the same time our research group uh, we created this electronegativity scale uh, and uh, you know how many other groups used the electronegativity scale we used? None. None of them used it. They all, they all still use the Pauling, the Linus Pauling electronegativity scale. Well, he did get Nobel, two Nobel Prizes, so what you going to do? Anyways, um, and it's still used today, the Pauling electronegativity scale. So if you go across the second row, lithium value is one. It's interesting. It goes up in steps of a half. If you're going to use just one decimal, and there's really no practically reason to use more than one decimal because this still is 
a theoretical uh, idea here. Beryllium is one and a half, boron is two, carbon is two and a half, nitrogen is three, oxygen is three and a half, and fluorine is four. So going across any other row in a periodic table, the electronegativity will increase. It might not increase in that same constant difference of 0.5. In fact, it doesn't, but it does increase. And going down a uh, group, uh, fluorine again, the most electronegative, and then it goes down from there. Now, you don't have to memorize the number. You'd be given them, but uh, they're there, and it's used to uh, create bond dipoles. There's some bond dipoles. So electron configurations of excited states. Bond dipole is just a separation of charge, sorry. So oxygen would have the lion's share of the electrons between oxygen and chlorine. I mean, there's two electrons that are shared in the covalent bond, but they're going to be hanging around closer to the oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine. Oxygen's polling value is 3.5. Chlorine is just 3.0. Electron configurations of excited states, I'm going to leave that out for now. And uh, so page 23 is just a nice review, and you can fill in the blanks. And there's some nice pictures. Um, and yeah, this is just a good representation of what we've been looked at here. You see uh, the fact that beryllium is happier than boron. Nitrogen is happier than oxygen with regards to the first ionization energy. So that's something for you to look through. Then we see some data about ionization energies. You know, I made up some numbers. I should have just looked at this chart. Here's sodium first ionization energy, 495.8. Look at the second ionization energy. That's a lot bigger. These numbers are bigger still, but the difference isn't as large. Magnesium, you have two, and then it's really big. Aluminum, you got three, then it's really big. So that means there's three valence electrons in aluminum. Here's a cool 3D graph bar chart of uh, the um, electronegativity values. Uh, atomic worksheet number seven, periodic trends. You can try those if you want. And uh, here's a review because we're going to have our first test coming up soon. So here's some terms you should know, equations, and uh, another worksheet there about periodic trends, atomic worksheet 8, um, page 28, then there's some more examples, and then we go to page 29, page 30 is a worksheet called Ruby, so you can try that one out. Um, and then a worksheet called taupe, which is a kind of brown color. You can try that one out. And uh, I'll have to give you a quiz soon. But these are just practice worksheets. Teal is another one. You can try that one out. Uh, Ottawa, I don't know why it's talking about an Ottawa radio station, but there it is. Um, so that is teal. There are even more practice sheets and videos on our website. Indeed, there are. So practice. I hope you're trendy and uh, get these questions right. And um, our next lecture will be in this unit will be a little review. And uh, hopefully you'll email me some questions and I can answer some of those in our review session. Sounds good? I think so. Have fun.